Hello and welcome to the video version of Technology and Space, where we talk about the science, technology, history, and business of space exploration and commercialization. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for watching. Well, what about you also mentioned a, a sun shutter problem, I think, on the Mariner? Oh, well, that one was okay. All right. That's another story I like to tell. Uh, maybe I've, I've, okay. Uh, what happened was <clears throat> we launched a spacecraft and um, a Mariner 6. And, and, and I, a, after about an hour, you know, it's up there and it's, it, we, we acquired Canopus, the Triton Star, after that, that. That was a little bit of a problem then. And, and, uh, can you say why that was a problem briefly? Can you just mention that? Because the guy who was supposed to do the identification, who spent two years writing software to do it, hadn't quite done it. But the attitude control guy, he looked at one number and said, we, we acquired it. That's it. <laughs> I said, no, that's not it. I got on the net and contradicted him. And that caused, oh, boy. Anyhow, we, I, I survived that. Now, now I'm off in a room. We're talking to some guys, and somebody comes walking in and says, "We have a problem. We have a problem." And I said, "What's the problem?" And he said, "The uh, there there was a 15 watt power transient during the launch ascent. 15 watts on, 15 watts off. That's a lot of power because the you know, total power for the spacecraft is 400 watts. So if you got 15 watts, that's a big chunk of your total power." And, and uh, I said, well, I said, I know what it is. And they looked at me, I said, oh, like, you know, like, uh, like I don't know what it is, and I expected that. And then I said, well, what, why is it such a problem? Well, the reason is because Schurmeyer, who was the project manager, was aware that on Ranger 5, one, two, three, four had failed. Ranger 5 came along and it was on the way to the moon. And and a national, t I, I remember watching, sitting watching this on on TV, a black and white TV, you know, in the old days, and and the, and the spacecraft is take is going to be taking pi pictures of the moon as it crashes into the moon. That's the Ranger mission. Mm -hmm. And and uh, they they said, okay, it's now it's time, and and the screen is blank, the camera failed. The Ranger six, they finally got it to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the Ranger 5. Part. So Schurmeyer was well aware of that. And the reason it failed was because during the shaking on the launch ascent, there was a power transient that they noticed in the telemetry, but they didn't know what it was. But it was the, re the relays closed and shorted out the Viticon. Okay, so he thought that this something like that happened again because he because of an unexplained 15 watt power transient. So he wanted to know what it was. Mm -hmm. I said, I know what it is. And, 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 and I, I said, um, what happened was the Canopus sun shutter, if it gets within 15 degree, degree or 10 or 15 degrees of the sun, it closes to, to protect the Canopus, the sun, the star tracker from the bright light of the sun. You know, it's like pointing at a camera at the sun. Actually, you could, you, you could do it, but uh, that's, that's, that's another one. But, uh, so, so what happened is that that shutter closed, and then and then as it passed through, it opened up. So it was maybe for 20 seconds or so, you had 15 watts of power. They said, "No, no, no, you that can't possibly be. How could you how could you have a 15 watt solenoid on a sun shutter? That doesn't make any sense. That's too, way too much power. It, it's got to be something else." I said. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you read my memo? Because I wrote you a memo on the subject and I described exactly what was going to happen when we, when we launch it. It's going to go through the sun shutter. And he looked at me, he says, get that memo, go get that memo, go get it. <laughs> so so I, I, I come back with one of these mimeograph uh, memos that I had written. I, 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 got, I developed the capability of writing memos uh, at, at JPL. I'll tell you a story about my section manager if, you, if we have time. But sure, the uh, that's what had happened. The, the sun shutter had, had closed, and I said, "No, it's 15 watts," because I thought it was a lot of power too. And I asked, I kept asking him, "Are you sure it's 15 watts?" Yeah, it's, they put a big solenoid on her because they wanted to make sure it would shut, close. You know, 
anyhow, that, that, that solved that problem. Oh, okay. And what about the mimeograph in your section manager? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, my, my section manager was, uh, uh, he's, I think he, he's still alive. So I gotta be careful in case he, in case he, he hears this, but uh, I'll, I'll just say it anyway, because I don't think he's gonna, he, he, um, he was very uh, dynamic. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but, but he would push. I was in a section of about 10, five or, five or six engineers, 10 or so. And he was a section manager. My immediate boss, you know, he's, I got along great with him. One of the smartest guys at JPL. I just happened to run across a very smart boss. I, I learned quickly just about everything I needed to know about space within a month or two from him. And But his boss, you know, was, was, was he wanted, he was concerned more about how his engineers looked to the outside world. So he wanted you to be able to make good presentations, stand up and, and, and talk to an audience and, and, and uh, you know, present your results, interface with the outside world. Well, in the navigation section I later went to, their, their, their philosophy, their management philosophy was Oh, only the only the very important people get to talk to the outside world. Everybody else is hidden hidden under a, a bushel, you know, and, and kept kept quiet. Mm -hmm. Way, but his attitude was you got to you got to learn how to be professional and, and do things, you know, like that. So, so I was totally total stage fright in terms of getting up and making talks and stuff like that. I was very and and yet I got this job of being the. Uh, a guidance and control analyst, which we had, I had like 16 guys working for me, and I had to present a lot of the results to, you know, in, in, in different situations. And I was very um, shy because I, I didn't, I, you know, I just I wasn't used to any public speaking. Mm -hmm. Boy, he uh, uh, just leaned on me heavily. He used to have a book about this long, you know, and when you'd go up into his office, you know, he'd go wham, you know, and, and then it started <laughs> like he's going to beat somebody up with it. And we'd sit there. <laughs> well, nobody was afraid of him. Was you know, we're engineers. We're not looking. It can't push us around. I, I, I was arrogant enough that he didn't scare me. But, but but he would do this. He would go through this routine, you know. And 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 anyhow, I I got into arguments frequently with the guy that became the the, the uh, deputy director of the lab. He was a Sierra Madre research and rescue guy. And he, he, was, he was a very dynamic kind of guy. He took over with the head of the spacecraft team, but he didn't know anything about the subsystems that I knew. He, he, he was a thermal and power and structures, but that, all that stuff doesn't have anything to do with when you're flying the spacecraft. It's the attitude control the scan platform and the power and all that. That's the stuff that makes the spacecraft go. That's my area. So he had to make all the decisions because he's the top guy. And I keep getting in arguments with him because he didn't know what the hell he was doing, but he was learning fast enough. And 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 uh, so I got into a, an argument with him. And, and, and my section manager, the guy, you know, the other guy, he says, if you, he says, I don't, you know, argue with him again. This is the end of it. You know, he, I, I had I had gotten into an argument with another section manager on another topic of. Few months before, and uh, I got in trouble over that because I didn't know he was a section manager. He shows up in the meeting, and I start arguing with him. And he was he was a high level guy. <laughs> he calls up the section manager and goes, anyhow. So I, I said, all right. So I, I forget what the argument was, but it, but about three or four weeks later, I'm we're, we're talking to Pete and, and all the and I uh, I I, I kind of lost my temper with him over some issue. I forget what it was. And, and he called up my section manager, I guess, and, and told me, uh, told, complained about me, uh, you know, not, not cooperating, let's say. Well, my section manager said, you're fired. I said, you know, so I said, okay, I, I felt, so I'm off the project now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, uh, I didn't care because it was, you know, there wasn't anything else to do anyway. We were on the way, you know, the spacecraft was safe and everything. And all the work that I'd done had been it was everything I was responsible for was working fine. <laughs> and, and then the guy who I worked on this other problem with, with the scan platform unlatch, he says, he says, okay, he says, I'll hire you. Come on over and work for me. 
well, when the six year manager find out that this guy is, uh, that I'm still going to be working at JPL now, <laughs> he immediately says, no, no, you're, well. you, you, you're not going to be fired. I'm speaking with James Miller, author of Planetary Spacecraft Navigation. You can find more information about the book on the Springer website. If you like this episode of Technology in Space so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more books and information on space history or the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. Well, one of the, uh, uh, the details of this are, 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 are a little bit uh, foggy, but I, I, I kind of remember it. Mm-hmm. But I decided that I was going to go work on the other section because I wanted to work on navigation. So but coincidentally, they decided to reorganize JPL, change the whole organization. And my second manager always trying to be aware of the latest things that are going on, you know. And uh, the computer guys that I work with, they were they 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 didn't get along with them at all. They just kind of laughed about it. Well he calls me one of the, the computer guy calls me back and he hands me like a J a JPL secret document about 20 pages thick. He planned for reorganizing the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Mm-hmm. He says, so he wanted me to go and, and, and show this to my section manager. <laughs> so I, I, so I, I know what's going to happen when they reorganize. And, and it was right, because later on, they did, they did all of this. Mm-hmm. Anyhow, so, so when I came back to JPL, I, I, I Everybody thought that I didn't get along with my with this section manager. Mm-hmm. Nobody else got along with them either. They they had me as being the number one guy who doesn't get along with them. Well, I, we we started talking to each other uh, over the years, and after a while, I, one of the guys that I talked to frequently about this stuff. Yeah, she's you know what? He says if it hadn't been for Dick Morris, was his name, mm-hmm. leaning on me. Forcing me to get up and give a, like a two-hour talk on all the stuff that I was doing to about thirty people. I just—I mean, I—I I, I did it. I don't know how I did it, but I—if he hadn't forced me to do the things that I wanted to do, I said, and he did the same thing to him too. Mm-hmm. And standards, we we wouldn't be in the positions we are today because we would be, you know. They love to hire you in and, and give you, uh, tell you that you're going to be responsible for a lot. But when it comes when it comes down, they just want people to uh, do the job and not not get not get involved in any politics. Let's say. Yeah. But, more, but my section manager wanted us to get involved in all the politics. <laughs> he went. Interesting. So, so what about um, you mentioned also on Viking? Um, you mentioned antenna gain issues or an issue and then the backhanded compliments oh yeah oh I didn't, okay yeah right. i'm running out of material here i, I, I remember that I what happened was uh, this is just just a story of um i uh, think uh, the kind of problems that, that you run into mm-hmm. the, uh, the uh, when the spacecraft separated from from the uh, when the when the when the lander separated from the spacecraft, it was way out there at the high point in the orbit, mm-hmm. and then the lander and the spacecraft would, would trail in 
and the lander would go in through the atmosphere and then land on the surface. And the spacecraft would then follow in about 20 minutes later and fly over. Okay, well, they wanted to get at least uh, a, a couple of pictures back because the Soviet spacecraft had failed within an hour after landing. And they were worried that, that our spacecraft would, 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 would not last an hour for some reason, but you have to wait a day for it to come back around again. because it only, it only flies over once a day, 24 hour, 24 hour orbit, 24 Earth hours, or 24 Mars hours. It's off by a little bit. Mm. So what they wanted to do is get a picture right, right there when they landed. Well, the, normally they would have the, the high gain antenna that they would point at the at the uh, spacecraft, and they would they could get a lot of data. They could get they could get the images that way. Yeah. But they couldn't get that antenna right away within 20 minutes pointed in the right direction. But they had a low gain antenna, and it was close enough that they could get communications with the low gain antenna. The problem was <laughs> the low gain antenna was on the bottom of the spacecraft. <laughs> and and it it radiated through the spacecraft. Uh -huh. So it had it had blind spots all over the place. Okay, In some places the signal was good. Other places, so when it flew over, it's going to go through. You know, it's going to go on and off. You know, when it hits the blind spots or whatever. But what they wanted is, was was uh, twenty seconds or sometime maybe it was twenty. I guess it's twenty seconds. High enough gain that they can get a picture done. Twenty continuous seconds. What I did, so can you find a twenty-second arc anywhere in there? Can, or will we be able to, or will it? Or if we when, when it flies over, what's the probability that it's going to get? Uh, that we're going to get twenty seconds worth of data. Well, in order to solve this problem, I had I had done. Uh, the, uh, there was a uh, a guy who was a programmer. He was he was. Uh, a really good program, and the the uh, computer was time shared. So they you block up block off time blocks, and each each time each, each block had thirty five thousand uh, words of memory space, and so they would time share them in and out, and put your program and run maybe five or ten jobs all at once. See, that's, that's the way the Univac Illinois worked. Well, the the antenna gain that they had determined by making measurements at Earth had 80,000 measurements, which means that I had to have 80K computer space. So I knew about this programmer guy, and I went over and I said, I told him what I needed. And he said, Well, he says, I can, I have a I have a compiler that you can you can run that will compile your program. And it'll take over the whole machine, wipe everybody else out, <laughs> take them off, <laughs> and run your program. And I and and that'll and that'll give you that, uh, you know, that'll work then. So I can then search through all these gains and figure out where the spacecraft was and how the lander may land and all that. And 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 I I did ninety I did I did uh, nineteen or twenty uh, flyovers. And I, on every one of them, I could find a, tw a 20 second patch. So I told the guys that you're going to get your communications probably. Hmm. But when we were testing this, um, about three months earlier, I was testing this uh, 80K thing. I, I, I brought my program. You, 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 you had all of the category A software, the category B software, and category, but you weren't allowed to put any category C or D in during operations. We were simulating a big operation. And so I go over with my boxes and card, and it's a category D program, you know, that takes over the whole machine. <laughs> and and I, I I told the uh, computer operator, I said, here, put, put this in and run it. He says, he says, who are you? I said, I'm the nav nav team chief. The nav team chief wasn't here. I was I, I was a, I was assistant nav team chief. So I, when he wasn't there, I'm the boss of the whole group. group. He didn't know. He didn't even know me. Uh -huh. Put it in there. I ordered him, you know, and and so he, he puts the uh, 
You put my program in there, just with the one that does this 80,000 thing. It takes over the whole computer, it crashes the whole system right in the middle of the test. So, so they said, you know, they're, and the big manager's up on top. They, what happened? Who did this? What did I, I said, I said, I did it. They're, they're about ready to uh, you know, hang me or something. I said, I said, this was a highly successful test because you learned that in order to run my program, you have to pay attention to me once in a while. <laughs> Something like that. I told him I was totally arrogant about it. I just, I, I, I'm the math team chief. I could do whatever I want. Who the hell do you think you are? You know? And, and uh, so, so anyhow, when we actually, when I actually had to run it for the real mission, you know, when we got there, uh, at least they knew from experience that they should. <laughs> well, what's going to happen when I run my program? Yeah. By the way. By the way, this program that made it 85K was highly illegal as far as the, man, the JPL computer people. It was all under the table. The guy had written it. You know. <laughs> he, he, was, he was a big, heavy guy. I forget his name. He weighed like 300 pounds. And he spent most of his time in his rose garden. He, 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 he uh, uh, cultivated roses. Mm -hmm. that, was all, that was all I knew about it. But I knew... Yeah, I, I knew how to get. See, I come from Pittsburgh. I come from inner city Pittsburgh, and when you're when you're a skinny kid, and, and you and you and you got all these kids that you play with that are that are sons of steel workers that came from Central Europe, mm -hmm. like guys that, that can be that in a sixth grade they they could play professional football. They were that big. You, you learn how to get along with people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what about the, um, the the backhanded compliments you had touched a little bit about last time the, on biking? And can you lean forward a little bit? I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay, now, now I'll tell you another story. I'll have to lead into this. Sure. I don't know if you know who Dennis Tito is. He He's the guy that is a Wilshire 5000 fund. He's a multi, he's a billionaire, basically. And... Uh, he was the guy that, that, that bought for $10 million a seat on, on, on the space shuttle and went up into space. I don't know if you remember that. Or, okay, okay. Sounds familiar. Okay. Well, he, went, he worked at JPL when, back in the 60s when I was there. He was, he was writing his software that enabled him to make all this money. Hmm. And he had access to computers and telephones and all that, just like I did. And, and uh, you could, you could, you could uh, if, if, you, if you were running an a, an outside business, it's a per perfect place for your office is sitting at JPL and with access to all, ex all the telephones and computers and things. But he was doing that kind of stuff, you know. And he, and he, um, he, he broke away, he left JPL. And Lou Kingsland was the, uh, worked at JPL. He was the mission manager in Viking. We know him, I know him pretty well because I, well, he, he was he was number two in the first graduating class from the Air Force Academy. He was smart, mm -hmm. and he and I liked him because he wrote very good memos. And I used to take his memos and and I copied his style of writing. I learned how to write memos by reading Lou Kingsland memos. I, I mean, it helped a lot. I already knew how to write memos, but he he had a way of being telling funny jokes too and making putting a little bit of humor in there. But he. He was the manager, and 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 we were getting under a lot. We were doing all these studies, uh, you know, for years, and he's aware of everything. And we we're getting a lot of criticism from the outside because of the sloppy work we're doing. At one point, they they were they they threatened to get the when the Apollo mission ended, they were threatening to uh, get all the people from Houston to take over the Viking navigation because we because we obviously don't know how to do it. Hmm. Well, of course, just laughed at that thought of that that they're going to do that because we knew they didn't know anything. But but he, but he kept telling us um, at one point he says, unless you're absolutely sure that you're right, if you're if, if you should just not say anything. It'd be better if you just didn't say anything. But he was famous for giving us these back of the um, back of the hand back of the hand compliments. You know, I I, I I can't think of an example, but he says something good about you and then and then qualifies it by. Saying something not so good, yeah. Back of the hand co compliment. It's a compliment, but it really isn't a compliment. Yeah. I, one time at the cafeteria, I just told him, I said, "Look, 
I'm sitting there, we're having lunch with him, and we're discussing this problem. And I said, look, I said, it would really help a lot if you cut the back of the hand compliments on and just, you know, and let us do our job instead of trying to criticize us all the time. It would be a lot easier on us. He's a, he's a pretty high manager. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he went with Dennis Tito and he became one of these uh, rocket scientists at, at, on Wall Street and made a lot of money. Yeah. And, um. That's okay. Um, do you know, I guess I'm not sure when you left, but uh, were you at all involved? Is Europa, the Europa mission, were you at all involved or have any idea, con- comments about that one? Well, the Galileo mission went to uh, Jupiter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this- there's four Galilean satellites, Aya, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Mm-hmm. And so, so we did fly by Europa. Now, whether there was a separate Europa, I don't think there was any, I think that's the last time we were there. No, this is, this is the one going up in like 2025. Oh. Um, and I guess they started studying yeah. it and that's gone yet. right. Well, no, I, I, I don't know what they're doing. I, I haven't kept up with any of the new missions. Okay. But I worked on Galileo and, and I, uh, designed the, the, uh, the navigation for, for flying by all those satellites, Io, Europa, again. I mean, because the ice said no, you know. But I um I was interviewing a guy who wrote a book about this upcoming mission, and he said I guess the plan is that for some reason they can't orbit Europa, so they're going to orbit Jupiter and gather data each time it goes around near Europa. What, what's that? That's what we did on on Galileo. We did that. We, that's what we did. Now, I, I I I was uh, involved a lot in the in the original design of the of the navigation for Galileo. I wrote a big paper on it. It's you know, still, but uh, but what, you know, what we did is you were orbiting Jupiter, then you cook, then you fly by the Galilean satellites, and you get in close, you know, through, you know, like three or four hundred kilometers, and take pictures. I thought if they if they wanted to orbit, it would take a lot more fuel to orbit. It would be hard to get into orbit around Europa. They should they should orbit it and they should land on it. Is what I think, and they should do. But, you know, I won't work on it unless unless it's unless it's going to be an advance of the state of the art. If they're just going to run something, to, just because they got some money to do another project and they're going to do the same thing without doing anything, you know, better. I don't, I don't usually, I just won't have anything to do with it. How much, uh, when did they make the decision to go around Jupiter to gather data on these satellites rather than actually orbit satellites? Was it a quick decision or did it take time to make that determination? You mean about, about, about whether or not to orbit the satellites? Right, right. They, could, they had to, or they could orbit, we could orbit Jupiter. We, we you know, on Galileo, we, we went in and, and, and orbit, got into an orbit about Jupiter by firing an engine for a long time, 500 meters per second or something like that. And we got into a big orbit that went around and you know, came back. But it flew by all these little Galilean satellites that were going around like that, you know, around Jupiter. Mm-hmm. We fly by them. We couldn't get into orbit around them. That's, that, that, so there wasn't any decision made to, to not do it because we couldn't do it because it would take too much fuel. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was thinking, yeah, I guess the mission was to orbit Jupiter, that the satellites were just a secondary sort of uh, not a priority compared to Jupiter itself. Well, it turns out that the satellites were the, were the main the main the main benefit of, of uh, orbiting Jupiter because Jupiter isn't that interesting. But the satellites are. They, they, we got back in 1980, I guess it was. Well, when Voyager flew by, but it, it just took one pass through and took a bunch of close up pictures. Mm-hmm. Those, those pictures of uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, they were the first time they ever saw them up close, and boy, they were spectacular. Mm-hmm. There was ice and stuff. And, well, you know, one of the, the, the greatest scientific discovery, um, I'm exaggerating a little bit because I hear this from the scientists, was the discovery of vol- volcanoes on Io. Okay. Well, that was discovered by the girls across the hall from me. Mm-hmm. And, and with their job, 
I call them the girls. I'm being a little bit, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going back into the past now. We don't, I shouldn't refer to them as girls, but, right. but certainly they, they, their job was to help with the navigation, the optical navigation of, of, of uh, I guess it was uh, Voyager, you know. Or was it? Or was it Galileo? I forget which one. Yeah, it was Voyager, I guess. And, and what happens is when you do an optical navigation, you have to uh, image a star and and, and, a, and a satellite. The problem is the satellite is so bright that, in, but in order to see the stars, you have to overexpose the image. Hmm. That, that makes the satellites the images no, not, not any good for science. But you have to be able to see the stars, so you have to open up the lens to see the stars. So that op nav images were, were you, you're lucky if you can see the, the limb. That's what you want to see is the limb of the of the satellite. That's well, she's processing this data, you know, sitting on there, you know, doing this, and uh, she looks at the image, and there's a little bump on on the on the limb, like a little. Like cloud bubble, a parallel parabolic bump in the limb, and uh, immediately determined that that's a volcano. <laughs> so the, our optical navigation persons, uh, her who was not an engineer, by the way, but I think they make her out to be some kind of a scientist now. I don't know what her, her education was, but she was definitely did not have a high ranking job. She didn't have a window like I did. I'm across the hall. I had a window. So she's in, a, in, a, in with a group of other losers. But uh, scientists go berserk because they want they don't want her to get credit for making this great discovery. And I, I heard them say that in, in, in future missions, they're going to make sure that we don't get to see the data or something like that until after they, they get to see it so that they can make the discoveries. They're just really angry about that. But uh, <laughs> But but then they, they had a they had a big controversy because the scientists somehow wanted to take credit for it anyway. Mm -hmm. was, who discovers things? And they made a decision. And this this is this is this was a big decision beyond JPL. The first the, the very first person who puts their eye on it and mm -hmm. and identifies it as as something gets that's the discoverer. It doesn't matter. Whose instrument was or whose planet was? Nothing matters. Eyeball first eyeball on on, on, on it is the discovery. Because otherwise, how else are you gonna, 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 gonna determine who, who's really responsible for discovering it? So I remember one time I'm sitting in my in my uh, in the operations area, and the guy who does the head of the optical navigation, he he comes into me, and he drops a picture on, in front of me. And he says, that's the picture of Deimos. That's the first picture of, an ast of a satellite of, of Mars or any satellite of any other planet. And it was a very sharp image. He said, but, so I'm saying, gee, maybe I can discover something. That's <laughs> he says, no, I already looked. He says, I already looked at it, <laughs> something like that. But oh, somebody, you know, there, there's, there's, OK, there's a ring to Jupiter. Somebody, somebody was walking down the hallway, and, and when it, images came in, they would put them up on the monitors. You know, like if somebody's walking down the hall, and they see, they look very carefully, and they saw a ring around Jupiter. And they said, hey, that's a ring. That person is the one who discovered the rings of Jupiter. <laughs> so yeah, so then the thing is, don't let anyone see the pictures until you get to, right? I had, I, boy, I, I was, uh, I would, just stories like this make me feel. I'm, I'm glad I worked at JPL because they, because these guys they they might try to control everything, but in the end they never really get to. <laughs> um, I'm speaking with James Miller, author of Planetary Spacecraft Navigation. You can find more information about the book on the Springer website. If you like this episode of Technology in Space so far, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more books and information on space history or the science, technology, and business of space, 
check out my YouTube channel, Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for fiction, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Now back to the video. So how about, I want to ask about deep spit, missions that go outside of the solar system, where I guess there's just one I can think of. But but how, is that more complicated or less complicated to navigate something that's just going straight out? Uh, that, uh, boy, both Voyagers left the solar system. Mm-hmm. The one I worked on just recently, before, before I retired, I went to Pluto, flew by Pluto, uh, uh, New Horizons spacecraft. That's going to leave the solar system. That, I mean, it's not going to, it's going to fly by some Kuiper Belt objects for sure. But, but actually leaving the solar system, you have to go, just, how do you define the solar system? But you have to include the Oort cloud, which is where the comets come from. And that's way out there. That's what? Way out there. Many, many, it's, it's going to take years for the, for the Voyager spacecraft to actually get to the Oort cloud and, and clear the solar system. But they did, they did uh, look for the bow shock. There's, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, particles that stream off from the sun into space, and when the, when the, and when the uh, spacecraft goes through it, it, it creates a, it creates like a like a like a, 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 a wave, you know. And when they when they when they go through this, they get something that, like a bow shock. I don't know what it is actually, but it, it creates like a conical shock wave around the spacecraft. So looking for that, Jupiter found, finally found that. I remember, <laughs> I remember I was working on here and, and, and uh, missing some data. And I, 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 I call, I say, what's going on here? Well, we don't have any data from, from Australia. Oh, well, uh, Jupiter is, Voyager needed needed wanted to look for the bow shock, so we gave him some data. I said, "What?" I said, "He took away my data without telling me about it and gave it to them." So they said, "Oh, all they needed." I said, "Look," I, I told him. I said, uh, "I got really angry." I told him, uh, "You know." So I went over to Dick Rudd, who was the project manager on on Voyager, and uh, he he worked. I worked with him on Viking. Well, he had about two people working for him. I I said, Dick, I said. I said, if you need data, I said, I can, if you tell me, if we get together, I, 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 can, I, can, I can plan the near acquisition. The near data has to be taken at certain points in the urban. And I, so I can't determine that until we get there to get, to get the really good data. Mm-hmm. And, and, and at any other time, I can always, you can track all you want. We don't need the data. I know the, the only reason that I don't do this on, you know, plan it out on a regular basis is that back when we started the project, we were we were the only spacecraft that was going to be in this region of the sky. All the other spacecraft were over, so we could have uh, continuous tracking from all three complexes, 24 hours a day. So I said, so the Farquhar, who was the uh, uh, may, may, making this decision, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I. I didn't expect that we would get during the, you know, for a year that we would get continuous tracking. But I said, if I got it, that really simplifies my job a lot because I don't have to worry about it. I just got the data. So we, so we right from the beginning, we got this uh, um, uh, committed to having continuous tracking data from all three complexes in the big and, and, and that, that was about three years before they actually, uh, we actually did it. So during that three years, other spacecraft wound up getting out of there. No, next thing you know, we got all the data, but they need it. <laughs> but then I told Dick, I, I, and he said, oh, forget it. He says, 
he, he didn't care whether 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 we, whether we saw the ball, ball shock or not. I think he was just putting in his time before he retired. He was hmm. he was rich. You know what he did? This is how when when he, when 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 he uh, was in Langley Research Center. He's going to come out to JPL for the, the for the Viking mission. So he's going to be here for two years. So you know what he does? He sells his house in Virginia and buys a house here, <laughs> figuring he'd flip it and sell it in two years and make money. And he drove around in expensive sports cars. So he was he was he was really good at uh, making during the time when the when the boom was was going on in California. He was making money like you wouldn't believe. Mm. So, that was Dick Rudd. Mm. So what about your uh, the book you have? That you're planning to finish by June 30th? I told him I, I think I'm done. I could finish sooner than that. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, get it done in the next couple of weeks. And what's that one again? Well, I, I'm writing, what I did is, I, is I'm, I'm writing a book on general relativity, all the general relativity that goes into the software that I, where does it come from? And I had some of that in the book that I wrote before, but, it, but I did, I never went into the, to the, uh, the really hard part, the uh, where does the theory come from? Mm -hmm. My 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 policy always had been on everything else I did. I don't go to somebody and ask them for an equation that I'm going to put in the software that I'm going to, that I'm going to write because I, I how do I know whether whether it's the right equation? Well, I can go and look at books. It's hard to find things in books. Forget about writing, reading papers. I mean, I got, I mean, I'd, I'd be all, spending all my time in the library if I tried to actually do this. So, so I would get enough information from people by talking to people to figure out what things were. And then I would do my own searching through books to understand. I have, to, in other words, for me to program it, I have to understand it. That's just a law that I made up. <laughs> I'm not gonna, if I'm gonna be, I'm not going to have anybody be responsible for my software. I am going to be responsible for it. Well, that that's that's unacceptable with JPL. That's unacceptable everywhere. I didn't care. I said that's the rule I'm playing by. And and if you don't like it, I'm just going to take my software and go home. Huh. So so relativity was the one part that I didn't really understand that well. Everything else I, I knew already. You know. mm -hmm. The heart, the, the biggest, one of the couple of biggest things that I did I regard as my big contributions, besides the, 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 the determining the molecules that uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, I don't get any credit for that because nobody recognizes it. But I, I, I developed a trajectory optimization software, which I, I derived my own equations for that. And mm -hmm. the biggest thing I did that was really needed for the near mission was there's a rotational dynamics or Euler's equations for rotational motion. Well, you have you have what's known as the variational equations. And, and essentially what, what you do is you differentiate the, the Euler's equation and, and you get essentially what you get are curvature tensors, same thing in general relativity. And I worked that out and it's, it's in the book that I wrote, and it's like about five pages of the very difficult mathematics because that was very difficult to do because it, you have matrices which are very, which are curvature tensors actually. I did a matrix, so two by two matrix, and you had to put zeros in some key spots because some things are zero. Knowing when things are zero is 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 the key to being able to write these equations, and and then you have to integrate them. And I had my, I had all that software to integrate. So once, so I was able to integrate the equations of motion, and this enabled me to solve for the the, the elements of the inertia tensor, which is very, and it worked. And also, I solved for the gravity harmonics at the same time. The gravity harmonics are on the, are on the, and so I worked, I worked all that mathematics out myself. However, JPL management thinks that I probably got it from, from JPL. I didn't know that I, I when I came to JPL, I already was ahead of them. 
in a lot of areas. I was behind in others. And I, and I learned where I was behind. So I, I'm, I'm responsible for half of the knowledge that I actually wrote into some of these programs. It's my, pro, it's my work. I mean, they, don't, they don't know that. They, they, in fact, what they do is they assign it to somebody else. The guy in our section who's, who's since I have curvature tensors, he must know about rotational dynamics. So, they, so the section manager made him responsible for this. Mm -hmm. a, couple, a couple a month later, so he quits. He goes back to Montana where he, where he came from. I think he quit because he knew he didn't know what to do. <laughs> I knew that, but I don't know if anybody else did. I, I wanted to see anybody duplicate my work. Well, one of the things is Einstein's summation notation can be used to do this. I'd, I'd like to see somebody do it because that would be a good verification that I got the right thing. So, well, I knew I was taking courses in general relativity and I never understood the guy who taught it was such a great teacher. He, I could I could follow what he was saying, but he was the kind of, he, he's the kind of teacher Harry Lass, he's a, he passed away years ago. But he wrote a book in 1950 on tensors, which had a lot of Einstein's uh, general relativity theory in it. I was taking his course three times. He taught it every couple of years. I asked him to teach it one more time. I said, Harry, I said, can you teach it one more time? Because at the very end of your last course that you did, you described the curvature tensor. And then I realized that these are, that I've been doing curvature tensors for the last 30 years. I just didn't know what they were. Same man, I knew what the math, I did the math mathematics, but I was doing it in a different way. And I thought, now if I if I can understand what I, if I could do it, I could understand general relativity. So he taught it one more time, and when he got done, I I, I went over to the uh, photographic department and got him a big picture of a planet, and we all signed our names all over it. We gave him a box of golf balls, and because he was only being paid three hundred dollars a month to work at JPL. Oh wow! He's retired, and he didn't have any. He liked to, He just wanted an office so he could just come out, come in and 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 work. You know to do his own things. So they gave him an office and they paid him a hundred, couple hundred bucks a month. So mm -hmm. I, I figured he, he, he's such a good teacher and he's such a good sport, you know. I actually I actually taped his, his lecture too when, when he was in it. But anyway. well, what was his name? Harry, you said Harry Stillman? Harry Lass. Lass? Lass, L-A-S-S is his last name. Well, he, has, huh? I, uh, I, he uh, Retired. And he's a, he's a mathematician. He knows he, he's the best mathematician at JPL, as far as I can tell. I never knew him. I mean, he's everybody respects him as being really good at mathematics. Mm -hmm. when, he, when he retired, his daughter is going to law school. And, and uh, so he goes to law school, he gets a degree in law, and he starts teaching law. <laughs> And, and he does this like in a two or three years, you know, hmm. so that he can help his daughter get through. Wow. You, that, it, it seems like that lecture you recorded of his is worth putting online somehow or letting other people have yeah. the benefit of. Yeah, I can see it. Knowledge. Yeah, I, 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 I recorded it and then I never really did anything with it. I, I wanted to do a video of him. He didn't want the video. So it was just an audio recording. Mm -hmm. What he has is what I tried to put in my book on my own, hmm. anecdotal stories about mathematicians and what they encountered in the past. Hmm. I tried to put those things. But my favorite one is, I think one, one of the most important discoveries in all of mathematics was that the square root of two is, is irrational. Hmm. In other words, it's not the ratio of two integers. You can't find two integers and you divide them, you get the square root of two. That's an irrational number. The person who discovered that was a Greek sailor and he was on the boat and he proved that the square root of two is irrational. And since the belief was that all numbers are, are, are perfect ratios of integers, they threw them overboard. So whether that story is true or not, I don't know, but it doesn't matter <laughs> because it's a good story. So. Uh, I put a few of my, I didn't put that one in, but I put a few others in that, that 
I just told them the way I heard them from other people. I know I deal with it. They're true or not. How, how many pages is this current book that you're going to put out? Is it a big one? It's, it's a brief. It, it, I, I, mutual potential just put the equations down that, that are in there. There's not that many of them. Mm. But uh, it's 100 pages right now. 92. It's a brief book called. Okay. The book has to be over 200 pages. That makes sense. That's what I kind of wanted to do the first time. But then they told me, you know, if you want to do a book, it has to be. So my, my book is 380 pages. I wanted to add another couple hundred pages to my book. And they said, that's too early to do, do a revision. So they said, and I, they suggested that I could do that. I said, well, I'll just do it on relativity. So I got it. And, and, and uh, actually, I'm including my wife on it, too. She, she wrote one of the chapters. Oh, okay. She's a professor at Loyola Miramar. Oh, okay. So we're, we're making a, I made her a joint offer. I can't control her, but I, I already got the book written and there's not too much she can do. Yeah. And one of the things that we, we she's too hard to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, um, so we've been talking for a little bit over two hours. Um, you said you don't have any more, no more final thoughts or words, because I don't have any more questions. Yeah, I think I've just about covered every. I'm going to start repeating myself, I think, if I keep going. <laughs> no, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah, mostly, mostly, uh, uh, I, I enjoy griping about about the, the current state of affairs, and and, and uh, when I talk to people that I that I hang out with, we're I'm the I'm the dissident, so to speak. <laughs> you're the guy. You're the guy saying everything, what everyone wants to say, but but doesn't. They can't. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you for watching this video version of Technology and Space. If you like this episode, please subscribe for more. If you want daily book suggestions for new science, technology, space history, and space please check out my YouTube channel, Space Walks Money Talks, and my website, technologyandspace.com. If you're looking for new military and general history information and books, check out warscholar.org, my YouTube channel, Warscholar1945, and my podcast, Military History Inside Out. If you're looking for new fiction and nonfiction books on sci-fi, fantasy, horror, gaming, and more, Check out chrisalvarez.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. Thank you for listening.